In this video, we're going to discuss cytochrome P450 interactions. In the last couple of videos, we've been focusing on the process of drug elimination through hepatic clearance and renal clearance. Over the next two videos, we're going to discuss things that can complicate elimination and alter elimination kinetics. In this video, we're going to focus specifically on things that can alter drug metabolism by the cytochrome P450 enzymes in the liver. To review, cytochrome P450 enzymes are responsible for phase 1 metabolism in the liver. These enzymes increase the aqueous solubility of drugs by either oxidizing, hydrolyzing, or reducing the drug into a metabolite that the kidneys are able to excrete in the urine. Not all drugs undergo phase 1 metabolism, but many do. That means if something happens that changes the activity of the cytochrome P450 enzymes, the elimination rate of any drugs that are dependent on phase 1 metabolism will change as well. And there are in fact lots of different drugs and molecules that do interact with cytochrome P450 enzymes and alter their activity. If you recall back to our discussion on enzyme kinetics in the pharmacodynamics chapter, inducers are molecules that increase the activity of an enzyme, Usually this is through upregulating its production. And inhibitors are molecules that decrease the enzyme activity, usually by interacting with the binding site or an allosteric site on the enzyme. Let's go through what will happen if a cytochrome P450 inducer interacts with a cytochrome P450 enzyme. This is going to increase the activity of that enzyme. So the metabolism of any drugs that's normally metabolized by that enzyme will also increase. Since the drug is being more rapidly converted to the metabolite, that means there's going to be less functional drug in circulation. Unless the drug is a prodrug that's designed to be activated by hepatic metabolism, in which case the increase in the active metabolite means there will be more functional drug. Also, if any of these drug metabolites are toxins, inducing cytochrome P450 enzymes will increase the level of those toxins as well, which can potentially cause more dangerous side effects. There are lots of different substances that induce lots of different kinds of cytochrome P450 enzymes. I've made a table of some of the commonly tested ones here. So these are the different compounds that can induce those enzymes, and then these are different subtypes of cytochrome P450 enzymes. Memorizing all of this can be kind of an ordeal, so I think it's helpful to try to look for patterns in the table and then learn those patterns. I've organized this table such that the drugs that induce the most different kinds of cytochrome P450 enzymes are at the top, and the ones that only induce one enzyme are at the bottom. One of the patterns I can quickly pick out of this table is that all of the commonly tested inducers induce cytochrome P450 enzyme 3A4, and none of them induce 2C19 or 2D6. So a question you might see is, which enzyme is activated by St. John's wort with the answer choices cytochrome P450 enzyme 1A2, 2C19, 2D6, and 3A4? And all you need to know is that 3A4 is activated by all of the common inducers to so be pretty sure that that's a safe answer choice. Another pattern I see in this table is that a lot of these medications are anti-seizure medications. So phenobarbital, carbamazepine, and phenytoin are all anti-seizure meds. So if you get a question asking which one of these medications induces cytochrome P450 enzymes and you see an anti-seizure med on there, that's probably a pretty safe bet. Of this table, I think St. John's wort is particularly heavily tested and I've drawn a little depiction of this herbal supplement up here. And if you think of enzyme induction as being green and enzyme inhibition as being red, you can remember that St. John's wort is an enzyme inducer because of its green leaves. Moving on now to inhibitors, inhibitors are going to decrease the activity of cytochrome P450 enzymes, which is going to lead to less efficient metabolism and cause an increase in the concentration of active drug in the bloodstream, unless the drug is a prodrug. So because this drug is being converted to the metabolite less efficiently, there's going to be more drug in systemic circulation. Here's a table of commonly tested cytochrome P450 enzyme inhibitors organized the same way as inducers before. The row on azoles is referring to things like ketoconazole and atriconazole, which are antifungal medications. And then of these inhibitors, I find that grapefruit juice is particularly commonly tested, which if you think of inhibition as being red, you can remember that grapefruit juice is an inhibitor because it is red. One more substance I want to talk about that's kind of a special case is ethanol. If ethanol intake is acute, so like having a couple drinks once a week, that's going to be an inhibitor of cytochrome P450 enzymes. 
But if the ethanol exposure is chronic, it actually induces cytochrome P450 activity through transcriptional upregulation of cytochrome P450 enzyme 2E1. So acute ethanol is an inhibitor, but chronic ethanol is an inducer as the body tries to compensate for the increased need for ethanol metabolism over time. Of course, an additional complicating factor is that chronic alcohol intake can also cause liver disease, which diminishes the liver's metabolic capabilities overall. So if you see a question about ethanol intake and pharmacodynamics, it's important to read it really carefully so you can figure out if they're talking about acute ethanol intake, chronic ethanol intake leading to induction, or chronic ethanol intake leading to liver disease. There are lots of different drugs that are metabolized by cytochrome P450 enzymes, but a few examples I'll discuss are warfarin, oral contraceptive pills, and antiepileptics. You can see how cytochrome P450 enzymes could have really serious consequences if a patient thinks they're taking the right dose of a medication, but they're actually being exposed to too little or too much because their cytochrome P450 metabolism is altered by some other drug or substance that they're taking. Let's use the blood thinner warfarin as an illustrative example. This drug needs to be in a very particular range in order to be therapeutic and avoid harmful side effects. Keeping it in this concentration is so important that patients actually have to have their levels regularly monitored. Too little warfarin in the bloodstream increases the risk of blood clots, but too much warfarin increases the risk of severe bleeding. Let's say you have a patient taking warfarin and they start drinking a tea with St. John's wort every day. St. John's wort is an inducer, so this is going to increase the metabolism of warfarin and decrease its concentration in the bloodstream, leading to an increased risk of blood clots. Now, if that same patient stops taking St. John's wort and instead starts drinking grapefruit juice, a CYP450 inhibitor, that's going to decrease the metabolism of warfarin and increase its levels in the bloodstream, leading to an increased risk of bleeding. It's also important to be aware that there's actually genetic polymorphisms in cytochrome P450 enzymes, and certain people might be able to metabolize certain drugs better than others. One example of this is that some people are ultra-rapid metabolizers of the cough medication codeine, and the metabolite of codeine is morphine. So these people metabolize codeine into morphine very quickly and can actually overdose on the medication because of the excess morphine that's around in the bloodstream. Cytochrome P450 genetic polymorphisms are one of the things that contribute to each person's individual pharmacokinetic profile for every drug. Cytochrome P450 enzymes demonstrate why it's so important to take a thorough history of prescribed and non-prescribed drugs, as well as any supplements. Unexpected things like juices and herbs can have a really big effect on the pharmacokinetic profile of medications by altering cytochrome P450 metabolism.